Hey guys, welcome back to Kerbal Space Program, where today, for the first time ever, we're going to go out and do an asteroid redirect mission. I say the first time ever because I've never really got it on video before, and to be honest, I've never really actually got one successfully done. I managed to move it out of line and, and stuff, but I've never really captured one into an orbit that I'm really after. But, before we do that, you'll see in the background here, I am severely messing around with some, uh, with some manoeuvre nodes, trying to get a, a, a nice, easy trans uh, transfer orbit from the moon to Minmus. Turns out it's actually really quite awkward to do, um, as is uh, indicated by this. I think it took me about 10-15 minutes to set up these manoeuvre nodes the first time around. Uh, I thought this one was good enough, but taking a second look at it, as I am just about to, I realised like, that that second manoeuvre there was just like far too much of a, a deviation from what uh, what orbit I had set up, and I, that's, that's not why I wanted. I want a nice smooth arc so I could just get out there, maybe a bit of an inclination change halfway around or something, which, which is fine. Um, so what I did next was, uh, well first I put myself into a stable orbit, a, a lot higher than I was already at, mainly for time warping reasons. Uh, you'll notice that quite a lot there I, en I ended up with though, you cannot go faster than this while at this altitude thing, and, and that just wasn't working for anybody. Especially as last episode we had already knocked off the uh, fuel to science ratio with that landing on the moon that just went horrifically wrong. Anyway, so what's happening here is I had set up a manoeuvre node and was trying... Oh no, this isn't a manoeuvre node. This is me trying to uh, circularise my orbit. And I'm very confused here. After a moment's thought I wasn't, but I was very confused in the fact that I was firing my rockets and they were pushing off the science uh, bays on the bottom half of my ship creating nice little phantom forces for me. Now, I say phantom forces, we can, we can easily explain where they come from, so they're not really a phantom force. Uh, creating these nice forces for me that were really just not helping. Um, I'm pretty sure within the next couple of burns, I'm like, wait, I can fix this. I know what's wrong. But as it stands at this point in the recording process, I wasn't really too sure what was going on. Okay, so more messing around with maneuver nodes because uh, that's, what half this, uh, that's what this game's all about, really. And eventually we're going to end up with something that actually gets in a nice smooth um, smooth arc towards Minmus. Uh, I eventually just settle on the on the plan of, right, let's just get the, the Apple app somewhere near Minmus' um, orbital altitude and then do a little bit of tweaking like this on, on, the, on the, the descending node. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and everything should line up. Or at least that's the theory that I'm working towards. And as it turns out, that was actually a good... Um, good strategy to work for. Now the strategy may very well have been very sound indeed, but unfortunately the placement of the moon just wasn't. Every time that I got something close, I ended up like having my orbit going right through the, the, the surface of the moon, which was mildly inconvenient, I suppose we should say. Uh, until eventually we get on to this situation here where, look, look how beautiful that is. Just the smallest tweak there and everything's looking fine. So all we need to do now is swing Gleety round, look at that maneuver node and start thrusting away. And for some reason uh, I turned off the back engine on Gleety. Uh, I, I don't know why I did that at that, that point in time. I'm, I'm still even looking at it now, I don't know why, but it's all right. I immediately went and did the correct thing afterwards. I turned off the four outside engines on Gleety and used travel bag small engine at the back to uh, push the entire vessel towards the maneuver node. This did mean I was a little late on my burn, but that's all right. The maneuver node system is uh, robust enough to be able to put me back on track, at least well enough to be able to uh, deal with it during the correction burn that we're going to make in, it's not interplanetary, in, in Kerbin's sphere of influence out in the middle of nowhere there, the, that one that I was just playing with. Uh, a realignment just to make sure I was going over the pole so we can get a nice polar orbit set up, and then we hit an alarm to do our change of SOI, and then back to the Space Center. So I can then go to the tracking station, so I can go find myself an asteroid, so I can find which ones are coming close enough, <laughs> and stuff like that. So we settled on eventually the asteroid RPN262. Snappy title if ever I've heard one. Uh, mainly picked for the reason of it was not like massively heavy, and it was coming in uh, for a fair, you'll see there, it's coming in really close to Kerbin's, which means that we should be able to kick it into the atmosphere so we can get a bit of aero braking on the go, because I hear that's the best way to slow down asteroids, rather than just like throwing massive engines on it and trying to push it around. 
Um, right, so the only thing left to do is set up a, uh, uh, what's this thing called here, an alarm clock, uh, which gives me enough time to fly the ship that we're just about to talk about out to high Kerbin orbit to rendezvous and do stuff. Speaking of that ship, here is the beginnings of it. Now last episode people were asking me, obviously after last episode, people were asking me why I favour this cockpit. And I'll be honest, like some sort of slutty whore, I prefer a double ender. Um, also, I don't have the lander can, so this is the only double ender um, expo uh, available to me at this precise moment in time. And that is why I use this cockpit. I know the internals aren't great and I know it's not the best looking cockpit in the world. But it sure is convenient, and that, that kind of wins out for me. As if the hulking mess you saw in front of you didn't convince you of that. Uh, so my design ethos with this is pretty much I'm going to put the claw at the front, a load of monoprop, um, uh, lots of reaction wheels, and then a great big fuel tank on the back to move the actual... Um, uh, asteroid around. Now I spent a lot of time um and an did I did I want a poodle, did I want a skipper? Uh, in the end I went for a skipper because hey let's be honest no one like whilst everyone likes a, uh, a high efficiency engine no one wants to be waiting around for six hours whilst they're waiting for that engine to complete its burn. So yeah I went for the skipper. I know I could have like if I was gonna go full hog with that that mentality I should have taken a mainsail uh, and now that I think about it maybe I should have taken a mainsail. But nay bother, this is what we're stuck with now. Um, and I feel I may have actually completely forgotten to put any monoprop on this vehicle. Which would be a mighty inconvenient when it comes to trying to dock with the ship. But, you know, we, we've also got pivot options and stuff on the claw, so it's not going to be a uh, complete waste. So what we're doing now is just setting up a sort of uh, funneling inwards fuel feeding system for, for a, a basic lifter. Um, because we're not we're not going anywhere special we're not off to juno we're not going to go out to like the deep sun interplanetary space or whatever we're just gonna try and capture the asteroid inside Kerbin's orbit i'm not gonna make anything ridiculously big and bulky um saying that i have used these massive engines on the side here but that's my workaround that's how i'm not using things big and bulky by using the biggest most powerful things so i can use the smaller number of them Yes, there is some sense in there somewhere, and if you if you got it, um, answers on a postcard, please. So actual shipbuilding over with. We put throw on some lights, and then we spend seven hours as we pause and try and think what we're going to call this thing. Uh, I actually went with the expendent. Uh, expectant rendezvous yeah that was great almost messed it up straight away um which not only was difficult to think of in the first place was also incredibly hard to try and spell uh you'll you'll see there not doing too good at this point i've actually like clicked out and i'm now trying to uh google it and find out how we actually spell this and as that's taking forever for me to drag my ass through it and do it we're gonna go to the launch pad Spelling issues aside, Bill Kerman has stepped up for this historic mission to come out to this plan uh, this asteroid. Uh, and as you can see, we've got quite an inclination on that um, approach vector for the asteroid. And you can also see our vessel is just a little bit different, a little bit different. On the outside engines, I've added more fuel. That's fairly obvious. And on the inside, I've also added those RCSs that I said I hadn't put on. It turns out I had. Um, also swapped the back engine for the poodle because I decided that efficiency did indeed win out over time savings. That, that's the way my space program works. I make a decision, I change my mind and then I go and do with the first one anyway. Um, yeah, so anyway, staging went well and it's time to punch our way up through the atmosphere, which we're getting quite good at now. Uh, this is Bill's... I think this may be actually Bill's first time in charge. Um, so far through this mission, it's all been about Jeb because you know he's just a glory seeking arsehole or something and i for one am glad to see these uh secondary players out showing that it's, it's not all about jeb you know bill, bill and bill and bob also do incredibly well and even all those unnamed masses that no one ever really thinks to to to, to remember about that they, they do all right as well i suppose you know I mean, who doesn't remember the Keytane adventures of Pat, Locke and Lenry? I mean, those two just went out and owned the universe. And here we are still singing Jeb's praises because he just happens to be the one that jumps into the driving seat first and doesn't give anyone else a chance. I mean, he needs to learn to play better with others. Honestly, it just makes me want to spit. Anyway, Jeb ran over. 
Bill is taking us up to uh, a nice, nice sort of orbital uh, uh, altitude, and now all we've got to do is circularize up nicely, ideally without wasting too much fuel. Uh, right here, we have burnt through all our external fuel tanks, and we're left with just this middle one here. This is a little bit, a um, little bit less fuel than I was hoping to have with me, but still within the bounds of what I had labelled as a safe mission parameter. Uh, safe might be a bit of a, a strong word there but anyway so we find our descending and, and ascending nodes and, and do just some some nice orbital orbital corrections to bring my inclinations in line so that we've got very very little work to do when the alarm clock finally goes off and tells us that yes now is the time to strike so the maneuver nodes have been set and literally all we have to do now is tweak those last few degrees because you know we all know it's all about getting that right down to zero zero uh, which I do believe I have done here make sure that the projected orbit isn't going to be crashing through the atmosphere because that's always a mighty inconvenient when you're doing things like this and then we get to appreciate a view we don't normally get to look at Kerbin South Pole everyone well at least everyone everyone I've ever watched do a video for and pretty much myself included only ever seems to go over the North Pole, but there we go. We got a, a glorious view of the Kerbal Antarctic. Uh, looked amazing, a fragile ecosystem that we should all try to protect for future generations and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, with uh, the, those maneuver nodes set, all I really need to do is think about firing my engines in about two minutes time. It's amazing the, the speed of the, how fast two minutes can happen. Uh, and yeah, this is about it. So I think it's time to say, Thank you very much for joining me for the beginning of these two adventures. Uh, we've moved Gleety up into, well, we've literally just pushed it into a, uh, its transfer orbit, and we haven't even completed that yet. And we have put this asteroid grabber in prime position to grab the asteroid when it comes through the sphere of influence. I will see you next time when we're going to move Gleety around and probably time accelerate to get that asteroid because all the interplanetary missions are miles off. But anyway, I will see you then when we do that. Bye!